ever noticed how boring white people food is? Have you, like the adorably earnest baby boomers in the 1980 film Garlic is as Good as Ten Mothers, a movie about hippies discovering garlic that features glowing descriptions of Alice Waters, incredibly awkward interviews with black and brown chefs, and the inaugural Gilroy Garlic Festival, yearned for more than boiled potatoes with the occasional crack of black pepper? Is your kitchen instead full of togarashi from Japan, dried Mexican chilies, and Middle Eastern za'atar? I know mine is. But the unfortunate thing about that global pantry, and that film, which was once described to me by a Filipino friend as the whitest thing she had ever seen, is that both are products of white privilege. What we put in our bodies has a simultaneous totemic and life-giving value. Individual foods are full of meaning, and that meaning informs who we are and how we relate to each other in subtle, surprising ways. Food brings people together, but it also keeps us apart. This was put into sharp focus on May 7 when, in an interview with The New Consumer, rising star recipe developer Alison Roman described Marie Kondo as having fucking just sold out immediately, and said that Chrissy Teigen horrifies her while staying strangely silent on the glossy scam that is Gwyneth Paltrow's goop. This public insult of two self-made women of color would be a bad look at any time, but it also gave the food community the perfect opportunity to call Roman out on her bullshit. Before this, Roman, who full disclosure I wrote a complimentary Forbes article about a year ago, was being described as the domestic goddess of the apocalypse. Partly this is due to her unfussy culinary philosophy, but her recipes also develop their own hashtags because Roman is brilliant at simplifying the cuisines of people of color to appeal to a white audience. Doing this is not inherently a good or bad thing, but if a white person is going to publicly co-opt the culinary capital of another culture, they need to acknowledge that culture and be mindful of how they are distancing that food from its original context. Culture, whether it's music or art, food or literature, gives us a sense of belonging, an idea of who we are and where we come from. Alice and Roman's careless decision to call a stripped-down chickpea curry a stew is one small symptom of America's deep-rooted systemic racism. But whether it's writing laws that forced Chinese immigrants to invent a cuisine to support themselves or forcibly removing Native communities from their ancestral lands, and therefore their ancestral diets, this country has always been exceptionally talented at using food to control people. As a pretty damn privileged white woman with a couple of expensive degrees, I'm not making this video to inform anyone about the everyday atrocities of racism. I have not experienced them. But there's no excuse for not being anti-racist. George Floyd is just one name in a tragic chorus of names of Black men and women who have had their lives snuffed out by white people in positions of power. One of the generations of Americans who have been executed for heinous crimes like taking a jog, hanging out in their own apartments, visiting relatives, and running successful businesses. I don't have any unique insight into these stories, but what I do know, and what I think you should know, what shocked me when I learned it, is the mostly forgotten history of the Afro-American crop that helped kick off the wildly profitable transatlantic slave trade. Cotton may have been king, but along with the indigo, tobacco, and sugar that built the American South, there was one other profitable plant, rice. Rice grown by enslaved people using their own ancestral farming practices. That rice, called Carolina Gold, by the white plantation owners who made their fortunes from it, is one of the first cash crops that built America. That's right, the money that paid for those palatial manners was stolen right out of the hands of black men and women, not just literally, but also in the sense that the very methods used to grow those fortunes were theirs in the first place. In his 2013 timeline of People's History of Carolina Rice, African diaspora food scholar and general badass Michael Twitty states that a red rice called a rhizoglobarama was domesticated in West Africa in approximately 3500 BCE. It spread throughout the region to become a staple in the diets of present-day Mali, Gambia, Senegal, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. Over the next thousand years, West African farmers developed rice into a true staple crop. To quote Twitty, trade with Southeast Asia, India, the Islamic world, and Portuguese carabels brought Asian rice, Oriza sativa, to different parts of Africa over a millennium. This includes successive waves of immigration from Indonesia to Madagascar, where immigrants mixed with indigenous Africans to create a Malagasy culture based on rice cultivation. 
Rice cultivation spread to what is now Angola and southern Ghana, in addition to several other areas previously unfamiliar with rice. Decades before Columbus reached the New World, European traders recorded their observations of the brilliant farming practices employed by West Africans. Stevam Afonso, a Portuguese nobleman who visited what was probably the Gambia River in 1446, commented that when he arrived from Cape Verde, he and his crew found much of the land sown, and many fields sown with rice. And he said that land seemed like marsh. I could spend a long, long time backing this up with accounts of the prevalence of African rice, the farming practices that employed both mangrove swamps and tidal floodplains to create ideal growing conditions for that rice, and the various Europeans who wrote down their observations about it. But I think this line from Sior de la Corbe's 1685 description of the Jola people sums it up nicely. There was no house that did not have a rice nursery nearby. While along the riverbanks, the landscape had been transformed into a pattern of causeways with rice plants appearing above the flooded fields. Despite significant historical evidence about the prevalence of African rice farming, by the 20th century, no Western scholars even suggested that the crop could be indigenous. In her book on the African history of rice cultivation in the Americas, Black Rice, UCLA geography professor Judith A. Carney notes that it took until the 1970s for academics to believe that Orizac liberma was from Africa. It took even longer for historians and botanists to agree that the sophisticated farming practices used to grow it had not somehow been taught to West Africans by the Portuguese. All of this is fascinating and infuriating, but we have a lot to cover here, so I'm skipping forward. See, the wetlands that line the coast of South Carolina look an awful lot like those marshy shores in West Africa. When English settlers arrived in the colony, they noticed this similarity. They thought to themselves, why not purchase enslaved people who'd grown up farming rice and use their knowledge to turn those wetlands into money? They did just that. And over the next several centuries, wealthy whites did everything they could to reduce those skilled agriculturalists to things. Things with no history, with no past, and thus no future. In Black Rice, Carney says of South Carolina that within just 20 years of its founding, the crop was being cultivated for export. By the mid-18th century, the cultivation of rice extended along the Atlantic coast from North Carolina's Cape Fear River to the St. John's River in Florida, in England for some 35 miles along tidal waterways. On the eve of the American Revolution, over the years 1768 to 1772, rice exports from South Carolina exceeded 60 million pounds annually. While most rice grown for export was the high-yield Carolina gold varietal of Oriza sativa, the historical record shows that African Oriza globarima, called red rice or guinea rice by colonists, was cultivated right alongside it. This lower-yield, comparatively labor-intensive red rice was often grown by enslaved people in the small subsistence gardens allowed by plantation owners. Carney tells us that by the antebellum period from the late 18th century until the start of the American Civil War, an estimated 100,000 slaves who so outnumbered whites in the state that it was given the nickname Negro Country were planting between 168,000 and 187,000 acres of wetlands into rice. All that thankless work made Charleston's white citizens some of the wealthiest people in the world. By the end of the Civil War, Southern rice plantations were decimated by the scorched earth warfare tactics employed by Union troops. They never recovered, and with them, the history of early rice cultivation in the United States was largely forgotten. But that said, we didn't suddenly stop eating rice, or the many other American foods brought here by enslaved Africans. Nobody in Louisiana stopped eating jambalaya, which is almost certainly an Americanized spin on West African jollof rice. Southerners didn't stop eating hop and john, which includes both rice and black-eyed peas, another indigenous African ingredient, every New Year's Eve for good luck. We never stopped eating gumbo, which derives its name from a West African word for okra. What would American food even be without cornbread and barbecue, collard greens and fried chicken? We owe a significant chunk of our most delicious, flavorful food to the contributions of African Americans. Carolina rice is just one small part of that story, a story rife with many more atrocities than the loss of this one piece of cultural heritage. In her recent New York Times op-ed on the death of George Floyd, Northwestern's Dr. Kihana Miraya Ross said that Black people were rendered as property, built to this country, spilled literal blood, sweat, and tears into the soil from which we eat, the water we drink, and the air we breathe. 
the thinification of Black people is a fundamental component of the identity of this nation. Reckoning with this reality is significantly more difficult than wrestling with prejudice, racism, and even institutional or structural racism. And it does more than any of these concepts do to help us make sense of over 400 years of Black suffering. The first enslaved Americans were brought here in large part for their knowledge, and then told at every turn that they knew nothing. That culture of dehumanization persists to this day. White privilege is the concept that your skin color, regardless of how difficult your life has been, is not one of the things making it worse. It is the largely unchecked multi-generational fallout of our slave economy, of European conquest, of the ingrained idea that Black people couldn't possibly have domesticated and cultivated their own crops. It's the ability to claim ownership when you, like Alison Roman, Adam Rappaport, or the hippies from Garlic is as good as 10 mothers, cook another culture's cuisine. It's the fact that until very recently, Carolina gold rice was still only grown on land owned by white farmers. See, in recent years, Carolina gold rice has been revived by the farm to table movement. Chefs like Sean Brock and Kwame Unuwachi have become famous for cooking it and for championing the heirloom foods of Appalachia and of the African diaspora, respectively. In 2017, the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation formally presented Queen Quet of the Gullah Geechee, a community of African Americans descended from the enslaved people of the Low Country, with seeds for the very rice her ancestors grew. African American culinary historians and cookbook authors like Michael Twitty, Jessica B. Harris, and Tony Tipton Martin bring these foods into the spotlight with every James Beard Award they win. New York's Museum of Food and Drink is set to present an exhibition on African American food whenever museums are a thing again. We're beginning to grapple with the complicated stories behind our food, our economy, and therefore our lives. There's no neat and tidy way to wrap up this video. America is broken. We have a criminally insane president who's more frightened of protesters than a pandemic. We have a police force that routinely murders Black Americans for no reason at all. But the work of our shared humanity is to care about other people. Black Lives Matter. George Floyd and the countless other men and women murdered by police officers in this country matter. Anti-racism requires recognizing our own internal biases and deciding to stand firmly on the right side of history anyway. Join the protests if you can. Make donations to bail funds, the ACLU, the NAACP, and the many other progressive organizations working to deal with systemic violence against Black Americans. Support Black-owned businesses. And if all you can handle right now in the dystopian hellscape this country has become is getting through a couple more days, that's good too. This is generally the point in the video where you would be asked to subscribe to my channel, smash that like button, and support me on Patreon. If you want to do that, great. I'll be making more videos like this soon. The next one is about the history of garlic as a magical object and coronavirus. It'll be fun. But there are many other voices I would rather use my privilege to uplift right now. In the video description, I'm listing several places to donate to, Black food scholars to follow, and including some lists of Black-owned restaurants around the country to get takeout from. Vote with your dollars, vote Donald Trump out of office, and make your voice heard. Special thanks goes to my very first Patreon supporters, Callie Karras, Matt Rabel, and Gabrielle Rabinowitz, to Christopher Kahn and Magi Ranger for being my biggest cheerleaders no matter how annoying I am, and especially big thanks goes to DeAndre Drain. He knows why. See you next time. Lizzie.